First of all, an apology. I, I have a terrible cold and a sore throat, so if I collapse and start sneezing, I beg your pardon. But I am equipped with handkerchiefs which should catch most of the viruses. This is the, a session which is an experiment, and when I put it to Joe at first, he was wondering, what are you doing? This isn't how we normally do it. And I want to thank him for trying this out, because you're the guinea pigs. So welcome, guinea pigs. New, nutrients have been provided on your seats, one dose of each. So this is your homework. And what this is is a summary that uh, came from the Adelaide Hospital Society of the government's proposal. So this is the, the two-page version of the 80-page white paper on universal health insurance. And I'm going to try and put this in some context for you. And the last piece of it is a set of questions. And these are questions that my colleagues and I have thought up. And before I move on, I want to say hello to Donald Butler from Public Policy, who is actually watching us on the web at the moment, but isn't able to be here this evening. But Public Policy are helping us and supporting us in this work. And we're a group of academics, health economists and the like, who have a common interest in the health system. So, shall we start with the first slide? Okay, that's us. We have different views about what the Irish health system should look like, and that's one of the interesting things. And we are not necessarily of the view that we're going to come to a common view as to what it should look like. But we are going to talk about it. What we all have in common is that none of us think we can, fix, we can change the current system a little bit and produce a working healthcare system out of it. Whatever needs to be done is a sizable change. And if it isn't done, we're going to get into fairly serious trouble. So, next slide, please. What we're doing is we're setting up a public debate. We're exploring the issues, the op options that are available to us, and some of the implications of those. And we're not going to make recommendations. We're going to say, here's a model, these are the implications of that model, another model, the implications, another model, the implications. And we're running a series of technical meetings in parallel with the public meetings where people who understand the mathematics involved can talk to each other and throw equations around the place and be happy. Next slide. So, you're the ones who are doing the work. We have a brief here, and I'm going to try and explain to you why we need to have a change. Okay, next slide. Basic questions for any health service. Who pays for it? What does it provide? Who decides the answers to the first two questions? Very simple, very straightforward, very clear questions. Who pays? What does it do? Who decides? Who chooses? Next slide. This is where the money comes from. I was asked on the radio this morning, who's going to pay for universal health insurance? And I said, well, the same people that pay for the current health service, everybody. The vast majority of the money for our health services comes from households in the form of taxes, insurance payments, and out-of-pocket payments. And the debate between a tax-funded system and an insurance system is really about the route that the money takes to get to the people who provide the services, to pay for the salaries of people like me, because you know, doctors and nurses and hospital managers have to eat as well. Drugs have to be paid for. But that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like at the moment. The government takes in a lot of your money, does various things with it, gives some of it, possibly not enough, to HSE, and HSE spends it broadly in these areas. You pay yourself. You might pay in the chemist when you buy a medication. You might pay your GP if you don't have a medical card. You might pay for prescriptions up to a certain level. You might pay a hospital inpatient fee if you're in a hospital for a couple of nights. And if you're in private health insurance, you pay a wad of money to the insurance companies. And the insurance companies pay that money largely to acute hospitals and consultants. It, bits of it go elsewhere, but that's largely where it goes. Can I ask a quick question? How many of you are in VHI or Glow or one of the private health insurers? Okay, so most people here are. And that tells you something about the composition of the audience. Okay, next slide. So, if, you, if the money is coming from households, which it is, the big question for different models of care is, are they fair? Are they equitable? 
Are people paying according to their means? So are people who are relatively well off paying more? and people who are not relatively well off paying less. And actually, we have a very progressive tax system. We have one of the most progressive income tax systems on Earth, which is very positive. Uh, other, other parts of our tax system are not as fair. Is it efficient? The Americans spend a quarter of their health care budget shoving money around between insurance companies and hospitals. This is not regarded as efficient. That money does nothing to enhance the health of the population, it makes insurance company executives really rich. And if you want to be really, really rich, I recommend you become the CEO of an American health insurance company. They're the highest paid CEOs on earth. It's an extraordinary thing. And efficiency. How much money does it cost to get this much health care? The most efficient health service in the developed world by far is the British National Health Service. There's no competition for that role. It's not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect health service. Every health service has problems. The Dutch health service is not perfect. The French health service is not perfect. And by God, the Irish health service is not perfect either. One of the things we have worked out is you can't just clone someone else's health service. I put it in here. We can't just clone the NHS or the Dutch system or the French system or anybody else's system. We have to make our own system. And that's why we need this kind of discussion. What do we want? Because at the end of the day, this service is for us. We're all using it. Some of us, like myself, substantially more heavily than others, but we're all using it. So we want a service that works. Next slide. What's wrong with our current system? We have a fairly young population, but our spend on healthcare is well above, it's not well up towards the, the middle quartile, the, the top quarter of European spend. So we spend a lot of money on a health service for a relatively young population. There are countries with much older populations spending relatively less on our health service. So that suggests it's not hugely efficient. It's not insanely inefficient either, but it's not hugely efficient. And it's pretty unfair. I don't know how many of you remember uh, who Susie Long was. She's the lady who died waiting for colonoscopy in Dublin. Turned out to have colorectal cancer. By the time it was diagnosed, it was inoperable, and she died. That's unfair. That's denying somebody a very useful service, which would have greatly improved their life, for no particularly good reason, except that she couldn't afford to pay for it. So, I, I heard that on Liveline, live. And at the time I was work I, I spoke on Liveline the following day, and at the time I was working on colorectal cancer screening, which we've since brought in. But that's not fair. And there's a lot of unfairness in our current system. And it's full of perverse incentives. We spend a lot of money paying people to do pointless stuff. I have colleagues who run diabetes clinics in, du in the Dublin hospitals who have 8,000 patients in their clinics. 10,000 patients in their clinics. I assure you, nobody else in Europe does that. I explain the Irish health system quite often to visiting foreigners. There are bits of it that people don't believe, and they assume I'm pulling their leg, and that's one of them. That care should be provided in primary care, but we don't have the resources in primary care to do it. So it gets done in hospitals by default. And we have a very hospital-centered healthcare system. People get up in arms about their local hospitals. They don't get up in arms about their local primary care centers, which is a pity. There's a beautiful primary care centre here, by the way. If you want to see what a good primary care centre looks like, there's one across the road. Next slide. So this is just inefficient. We need, to pay, we need to send the money where the care should be delivered. We need to support people looking after themselves at home, which we do to an extent, but not to the extent we should. We need to support a lot more care being delivered in the community. We need to support a lot more care being done by GPs, by community pharmacists, by practice nurses, and by public health nurses. And that means moving money. And it means coming up with a payment system that moves money to that sector. So, next slide. Why do we need to make a change? Everything has kind of staggered along nicely enough up to now. What's happening, and it's, we're now in the middle of it, is that our population is starting to get older. We have had a very young population by European standards. But the number of people 
over 55 is going up very quickly. The number of people over 85 is going up very quickly. And these people place substantial demands on the healthcare system. And we're not geared up to cope with it. So actually things are going to get more difficult over the next 10 years unless we do something. So, next slide. This is a slide that frightens most people. See the top corner. This is American data. We don't, we don't have equivalent Irish data that I know about. 1% of the American population spends 20% of healthcare costs. 5%, the next one down, spends half the total healthcare costs. The smallish group of people on whom the money goes. And in our society, that group is expanding very rapidly. And that's the problem. That's the, the, that's the challenge facing the system. That's the challenge we have to deal with. We have to deal with it by developing a more efficient system. The Americans have a horrendously inefficient system. It's both horrendously inefficient and horrendously unfair. That's not where we want to go. Next slide. This slide tells a nice story. The green arrow is 2000 to 2009, the Celtic Tiger, more or less. And the blue rectangle under the green arrow is Irish healthcare expenditure going up annually. The red arrow is 2009 to 2011, and the dark blue rectangle above the red arrow is Irish health expenditure falling off a cliff. We've taken an enormous amount of money out of the health services. In some ways, it's miraculous that they continue to function as well as they do. We can't go on doing this. Next slide. That's the slogan. That is the logo from the white paper. Equal care, cost-effective delivery, timely access, quality and patient safety. That's what we have to achieve. That's what we have to get. There are various ways of getting it. The government's proposal is one of the possible ways, and in our, in our brief, we mentioned some of the others. We could go to a National Health Service. That's definitely one option. We could go to a single insurer. But we have to have something that drives three things. It drives efficiency. It drives integrated care. It drives sharing of care between primary care and secondary care. It's a patient-centered system placing a priority on delivering care at the lowest level of complexity that's appropriate. And in many cases, that's the home, primary care, secondary hospitals, more specialized hospitals. And for some care, we deliver it outside the country. There are skills that we don't have in this country. It makes sense to, to deliver that care outside the country. We pay for it. But we have to have a system that thinks like that a system that's focused on the patient's requirements. It's not focused, as the current system is, on the requirements of the institutions in the system. And it's not going to be easy to do that because some institutions are going to lose resources and they're not going to be very pleased. And some institutions, notably primary care, are going to gain resources. Presumably they'll be more pleased. But that's what we have to do. So we want to start a discussion, and I'm going to pass you, over, pass you back to Ingrid in a moment. What are your questions about this? What do you want to see? What are your thoughts about the ideas we've been talking about? How do you feel about a substantial and significant change in how you receive health care? Next slide. That's the summary of the questions that we came up with, and we're going to actually leave that on the, on the, the screen, if that's okay. Um, there's a little more detail here, and I will go back to Ingrid. So thank you very much.